the winner of the 2016 John Newberry Medal for the most distinguished contribution to children, literature for children is the last stop on Market Street. As you may know, that book is by Matt De La Pena, <laughs> with illustrations by someone else you've seen, Christian Robinson, published by G.P. Putnam Sons Books for Young Readers, an imprint of Penguin Young Readers, and edited by the brave Jennifer Besser. <laughs> CJ's journey with his Nana is not just a simple bus ride. It is a multi-sensory experience through which he discovers that beautiful music, nature, and people surround him. CJ's questions are familiar, and Nana answers him with gentle wisdom. Right up until their arrival at the last stop on Market Street, Nana guides CJ to become a better witness for what's beautiful. Through rhythm and rhyme, varied sentence structure, alliteration, and well-timed page turns. The story of CJ and his Nana is crafted to elicit questions, to spark imagination, and to make us laugh. Matt De La Pena, please come forward to accept your 2016 Newbery Medal for the last mark. <laughs> last stop on Martin Street. I think that, uh, you know, there are people in our lives that help us so much. So I'm going to give this to my mom. Oh. <laughs> wow, came in soft. <laughs> okay. So, I went to one, I've been to one of these before, and I was sitting at a table with authors, and Katie Camillo was giving the Newberry speech, and yeah, she's done a few of them, but, um, <laughs> and I turned to the author next to me and I said, man, she's killing it, and he was like, yeah, she's killing it, and I said, I'm glad I never have to do this shit. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to uh, I want to warn the authors out there right now. Just be careful what you're thinking right now. <laughs> um, it's it's an honor to be uh, recognized um, along with Pam, Victoria, and Kimberly. I just wanted to say that right off the front. And I also want to say, is Reforma in the house? <laughs> Reforma has agreed that if anybody's mean to me during the speech, they will act as my bouncers. So, I will just... Okay, I'm gonna do the speech now. I had never known, never even imagined for a heartbeat that there might be a place for people like us. This is the last line of Dennis Johnson's short story collection, Jesus' Son, and it describes perfectly the way I felt way back in 2003 when I was informed that my first novel, Ball Don't Lie, was going to be published by Random House. And it describes the way I feel tonight, too, over a decade later, as I stand here among you all, all dressed up, fresh haircut, seated at the table. Growing up, I never could have imagined this, me and books, reading, no way, I was a working class kid, a half Mexican hoop head. I spent all my after school hours playing ball down at the local pickup spot off Birmingham. I dreamed of pretty girls and finger rolls over outstretched hands. But age has a way of giving perspective. It turns out I was wrong. 
Turns out I've been a reader all along. Maybe I didn't have my nose in a novel, but I read my old man's long silences when the two of us sat in freeway traffic in his beat up old VW bug. I read the way he pulled himself out of bed at 3.30 every morning to get ready for work and how he never took a sick day. I read my mom's endless worry about the bills, about the empty fridge, and I read the way she looked at me and my two little sisters like we were special, like we could make something of ourselves. <clears throat> I read the pickup politics at Muni Gym in Balboa Park, how the best players assumed a CEO-like power the second they laced up their kicks and called out to the crowd, check ball. And I read how these same men were stripped of this power as soon as the games died down and they set foot outside the gym out of their domain and back into yours. I didn't read past page 27 of Catcher in the Rye, but I read Basketball Digest cover to cover every single month. I'd show up at my junior high library an hour before school, find an empty table and back, and tuck the latest issue inside the covers of the most highbrow book I could find. <laughs> usually some Russian novel with a grip of names I couldn't pronounce. Miss <laughs> Frank, the warm, smiling librarian, would occasionally stroll past my table and say, war and peace, huh? <laughs> How you liking that so far? <laughs> oh, it's great, miss, I'd tell her. I really like all the wars and stuff, and then how it becomes peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> She'd grin and nod and then move on to the next table. I'd grin too, marveling at my own slick ways. <laughs> but then a few days later, she'd confuse the hell out of me by sliding across the table the latest issue of Basketball Digest with a wink. That's, that's funny, that was funny. <laughs> Back then, I never would have described myself as a reader, but Miss Frank knew better. And the truth is, I wasn't reading those magazines for stats or standings. I was reading to find out what certain players had to overcome to get where they were. I was in it for the narrative. And what I found in some of the better articles wasn't that inferior to what I would later discover when I read War and Peace for Real. Over the past 10 years, I visited hundreds of schools and met with tens of thousands of young people. And so many of them are like that old version of me. Self-defined non-readers who spend all day reading the world. My mission as an author now is to help a few of them translate those skills to the written word. It didn't happen for me until college when I was int int introduced to books like The Color Purple. Their eyes were watching God. 100 Years of Solitude, Drowned by Juno Diaz. When I finally fell for literature, I fell hard. But what if I can nudge a few of these kids toward the magic of books at a younger age? What if I can write a story that offers that tough, hooded kid in the back of the auditorium a secret place to feel? I had never known, never even imagined for a heartbeat that there might be a place for people like us. Unfortunately, we don't always get that far. Sometimes we have to back up and address something much more basic and urgent. Hey, mister, I've heard time and time again, usually at the poor schools, why would you come here? The subtext is obvious. This school is not worth your time. We are not worth your time. When I sat down to write Last Stop on Market Street, this troubling mindset was rattling around inside my brain. Nana, the wise grandma in the book, is urging CJ to see the beauty in his surroundings, yes. But she's also steering him towards something much more fundamental. She's teaching CJ to see himself as beautiful, to see himself as worthy. Sometimes when you're surrounded by dirt, CJ, you're a better witness for what's beautiful. And sometimes when you grow up outside of the American dream, you're in an ideal position to tell the truth. Here's a truth. We don't all operate 
under the same set of rules. Here's the truth. Our stories aren't all assigned the same value in the eyes of many decision makers. And what are we going to do about it? There was something else on my mind when I wrote Last Stop. Up to that point, I had published a handful of literary urban novels that tackled race and class head on. I was proud to see those books carve out a real presence in schools with diverse populations. But when I visited the more affluent schools, the private schools, my books were harder to find. Either they were set aside on the, the diverse books shelf, or they weren't there at all. This pissed me off. <laughs> Oops. And why is it so common for me to see a class full of Mexican kids reading The Catcher in the Rye when I almost never see a class full of white kids reading Yaki Delgado Wants to Kick Your Ass? <laughs> Sometimes I'm part of the problem too, I will admit. A librarian once emailed me to ask me to be uh, a guest at her school. And she said, I'm so excited, Matt. You're going to be my Mexican author. <laughs> Ooh, I love the gasp. And I was like thinking to myself, oh man, if, if she had really read my books, it's actually a lot of them are about not feeling Mexican enough. And then her next email said, We've just received a very generous grant from the district. We're prepared to offer you double your current honorarium. And I wrote back and I said, ma'am, I'm your Mexican author. <laughs> <laughs> a few years later, I had a much more troubling exchange. It was at a national conference like this. Um, and a librarian came hustling up to me uh, between events. And she introduced herself and she said, I'm so glad I, I found you. I wanted to tell you I really like your books. Now listen, we don't have those kind of kids at our school, so we don't really carry that many of them, but I wanted you to know we really like your books. And I was like, no, I totally understand what you're saying, ma'am. Just out of curiosity though, how many wizards do you have at your school? <laughs> Special shout out to Tim Federley for, that, for giving me those words. <laughs> for arming me. With Last Stop, I set out to try something new. I wanted to write a book featuring diverse characters and a storyline that, that wasn't focused, at least overtly, on diversity. When I finished the 70-something draft of the text, I was proud of CJ's journey, both inside and out. And I was proud of the music of the language. But it wasn't until I saw the words transposed over Christian Robinson's soulful and whimsical art that I first wondered secretly, of course, very secretly, if we might have made something special. But I never imagined anything like the morning of January 11th. I was in Minneapolis that week teaching at Hamlin University with Prince winner Laura Ruby, by the way. <laughs> Shout out to Prince, uh, Laura Ruby. She's a badass, just so you know, she's a badass. I had stayed up till 2.30 a.m. finishing up my next YA novel. It felt amazing to send the, the manuscript, uh, manuscript off to my editor. I could finally rest. Before I went to sleep, I set my phone next to the bed and turned on my ringer. There was a little buzz that last stop could possibly get some sort of a Caldecott recognition. Thank you. Oh, really? <laughs> And I knew the committee wouldn't call me, but Christian and I share the, share the same agent, Stephen Malk, and I thought, Steve's a good guy. He'd fill me in, so I'll <laughs> leave my phone on. An hour later, the phone rang. It wasn't Steve. The man on the line said, hello, Matt. My name is Ernie Cox, and I'm calling on behalf of the John Newberry Committee. We have some news. I remember thinking, this guy must have been out late drinking. <laughs> he said the wrong committee name. I remember also sitting up and pressing the phone closer against my ear. Your book, Last Stop on Market Street, he went on, 
has been awarded the 2016 John Newberry Medal. A chorus of committee members cheered behind him. At first, I was just really, really confused. <laughs> and then I was overwhelmed. Before that morning, I hadn't cried since I was 13 years old. Sadly, this is not an exaggeration. My dad's a tough dad. But in the middle of that short conversation with Ernie Cox and the rest of the committee, the streak was broken. Big, fat tears rolled down my cheeks. Not because I felt happy, though I definitely felt happy, but because in that moment, it felt like I'd been forgiven for all my shortcomings as a writer. This job can be a lonely, lonely road, and it's not always easy to maintain self-belief. 99% of the time, the words don't seem quite good enough. 99% of the time, your characters don't seem quite real enough. Or worst of all, you don't feel quite talented enough. At the end of every single workday, I find myself muttering the same two sentences over and over. I should have accomplished more today. I should have been better. But on that morning of July, January 11th, these people on the phone were telling me I'd done something good, something worthy. I couldn't speak for a long stretch of time. I was too busy trying to understand. Matt, Ernie Cox said, are you still there? <laughs> as soon as we hung up, I called my wife, Caroline. Or I called my wife. Caroline, I said, <laughs> Caroline, I said in an even voice, I have something to tell you. I paused for a long time trying to keep things in check because she couldn't hear that kind of stuff. What, she said, is everything okay? I think last stop just won the Newberry. She paused and said, wait, are you sure? <laughs> And I answered, no. <laughs> she fired up her iPad and went to the, onto the ALA website and looked up, <laughs> it's a true story, and looked up the 2016 award committees and asked, okay, was it a man or a woman on the phone? <laughs> and I said, it was a man. And she said, holy shit. <laughs> There are so many people I want to acknowledge. First and foremost, I want to thank Christian Robinson. Christian, could you just stand up real quick? Last Up on Market Street is a picture book, and I've always believed that your brilliant illustrations are what make this book what it is. You're a special person. And your Nana, Lee Jenkins, is a special woman. I'm honored to be your friend and collaborator. Stephen Malk, my guy. <laughs> I, I stand by what I told you back in January. You are the Steve Nash of children's books. <laughs> Not only did you pair me with Christian, but you're the one who actually suggested I try picture books in the first place. I remember the first time you said it, I was like, this guy's crazy. I would never write a picture book. But it turns out that was a good idea. <laughs> and uh, Steve, you're like family to me. My editor, Jen Besser, thanks for taking a chance on this book and for fighting, most importantly, behind the scenes to keep CJ's dialogue authentic, and for fighting to keep the music and poetries of the city intact. Cecilia Young and Lauren Donovan, thank you for being the very first champions of CJ's story. Cecilia, I'll never forget the two-hour conversation we had back in LA, back when the book was nothing more than a single-spaced spoken word poem. Your heart is all over this book. And Lauren, you are a publicity magician. <laughs> and I know, so, I know about that stuff. You helped give this book a life way before any stickers were involved. To the entire Penguin School and Library Department, especially Carmela, Vanessa, and Mexican white girl Alexis. <laughs> I can't begin to explain how much your support has meant to Christian and I over the past year. 
Thank you for all your hard work. And also, I just like hanging out with you guys. <laughs> to Jen Logia, president and publisher of Penguin, and everyone else at Penguin who touched this book in any way, I'm so grateful to each and every one of you. A special thanks to my Random House family, especially my incredible editor, Krista Marino. You are the reason that I was allowed into, even, even allowed into the building tonight <laughs> because she published my first book back in 2005. Thank you for guide, guiding all my YA stories. To all you librarians who work tirelessly to put good books into the hands of young people, thank you for your profound vision. In a time when some folks want to build walls, you give young people the tools to tear them down. Thank you for seeing me, and thank you for seeing all those kids who are sometimes labeled as non-readers or mess-ups. It may not look like it, but they're listening too. To my family, the De La Peñas. Mom, you're the reason I tr By the way, take care of that medal. <laughs> <laughs> Mom, you're the reason I try hard at life. Thanks for letting me run every single draft of this book past you. Turns out your feedback was Newberry medal worthy. <laughs> Dad, thanks for teaching me the world. I've told the story of your late turn toward literature a bunch of times, but I've never told anyone this. I drew on your quiet wisdom for every last word of Nana's dialogue. <laughs> Caroline, Caroline, my wife, my best friend, I see you. I've been on the road a lot these last couple years, and when I've home, been home, I've been on deadline. You've been supportive through it all even though you have a full-time job and you have a full-time kid. I see you and I love you. And there's nothing I'm more proud of than the life we're building together. To my two-year-old daughter, Luna, who's back in our hotel room right now sleeping, in theory. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Luna, for giving me incredible joy and making my heart beat with a purpose. And I also wanted to say, I wanted to thank everybody who's received an award this week. Um, not just the people here tonight, but all the awards that have been given, a while, given out this week. Uh, I saw the CSK breakfast this morning, and it was just incredible. It was one of the most moving experiences I've had in books. A special thanks to the We Need Diverse Books people and SCBWI. I'm proud to be on the board of both, and you guys are doing incredible work. And finally, to the 2016 John Newberry Committee, I'm humbled beyond words by this mind-blowing honor. What makes me especially proud is thinking of all the underrepresented readers out there who desperately need to see themselves in books, even though they don't know it. I need to tell you about two of them right now. The first is a girl I met at a really rough high school in Newark, New Jersey. An organization called My Very Own Library donated 100 of my books to students. And at the end of the presentation, the kids got in line to have them signed. One African-American girl, frizzy braids, dirty jeans, messed up teeth like mine, took her signed copy and looked at it and then looked at me and said, ain't you going to ask for my autograph, mister? Her girls laughed and laughed and laughed. And one of them said, now why is he going to want your autograph, dumb dumb? You aren't famous. Normally, I would have laughed right along with them, but I saw her face. Instead, I handed this girl my Sharpie and held out the inside of my forearm and told her, hell yeah, I want your autograph. I don't have paper, so why don't you sign it right here on my skin? Because maybe this is the kind of audacity it takes to be someone when you come from nothing. 
And maybe this is the kind of audacity we need in the book world in order to finally give young people hero choices that reflect our current population. And finally, by the way, this clapping makes me feel like Obama. It's amazing. <laughs> and finally, I want to tell you about a kid I met in Virginia last year. I just presented to his entire elementary school in the auditorium. I read Last Stop. I told a few secrets about the book. But before I said goodbye, I explained that I wanted to give away my own copy of the book. The whole time I was talking, I told him, I've been watching you. And there's this one kid I've decided I need to give the book to. I walked up into the crowd and handed it to a boy who was sitting sort of off on his own. He took the book and everyone clapped and I said goodbye. As I was leaving the school about 15 minutes later, a few kids came and gathered around me. They wanted to talk as the kids sometimes do. And suddenly the boy I'd given the book to appeared. He was still clutching it in his hands. Hey, mister, he said in a quiet voice, why'd you give it to me? I shrugged and told him, I'm not exactly sure, but I think there might be something special in you. I, I can feel it. And then something powerful happened. He began to cry. And the other kids rubbed his shoulders and patted him on the back. And someone told me, he just moved here. He's new. I watched this for a while, how everyone was gathered around him, how they held him up and smiled at him. For a brief second, our eyes met, me and this kid, and I knew something important was happening. On my flight home, I kept thinking about that boy and his tears and how tightly he was holding onto the book and how his classmates met him, made him feel their presence. I didn't know what it meant, but I knew it was significant. Then in January, you committee members called and told me about the Newberry, and I became that boy. I got emotional, and questions flooded my head. Why had you picked me? Did I deserve it? Am I worthy? And then so many of my fellow writers and illustrators reached out after the news was announced and rubbed my shoulders and patted me on the back and told me how happy they were. <clears throat> For several months, I have tried to process what has happened, but I finally realized I will never truly understand what this means. It will forever be a beautiful mystery, a significant one. I had never known, never even imagined for a heartbeat that there might be a place for people like us. Thank you.